Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Great. Great. All How's right. that lecture relevant to current conditions? <laughs> I thought about calling an audible really quickly and seeing if everybody wanted to just do the field trip like this weekend, but I, I didn't. That, I mean, I wonder like... if you would. I, I'm game for it. <laughs> we could go to Bronco Stadium. Yeah, exactly. I, I would get in a lot of trouble if we dug a hole in the blue turf. Like I might. That's a that's a fireable offense at Boise State. So. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope you all had a great President's Day weekend and enjoyed kind of the extra day off from uh, school. I hope you didn't have any um, Zoom meetings yesterday. I I still, no rest for the wicked, I guess. I had a couple, so. Um, so uh, today, I at the end of class last time, we were gonna do this activity, um, kind of examining where, um, where we might expect to find kind of higher and lower uh, magnitudes of different energy fluxes um, in in the landscape from a snow perspective, um, I'm we have another activity today, so I don't want to overburden everybody with activities. So we we will skip that one. Um, uh, and you know, truthfully, you're going to come back to that in um, in hydrology later on anyway. And for those of you that ultimately go on to take like snow and ice physics from HP Marshall, you'll cover it in like, you know, very, very fine detail. So um, I think that in terms of the objectives of that class, we this class, we probably, you know, met them in terms of discussing what the different energy fluxes are, right? So, um, okay, so this week, um, we're, we're gonna sort of take a step up in scale, right? Last week was really sort of focused on you know, individual snow measurements and understanding how the snowpack changes at sort of like a very small scale. Um, we're going to sort of go up in scale a little bit and and think about, um, you know, how much snow is stored in, in a watershed. And real quick, um, I don't know, maybe the best way to do this um, is just a show of hands. I, you know, so it, it's, I don't know, where folks are at um, in terms of, uh, you know, to what extent this is discussed in other classes, um, but does, does everybody have a good sort of formal definition of what a watershed is? I guess, raise your hand if you could sort of like present what a formal definition is, or if you could sort of delineate a watershed. Okay, so, sort of so-so. I see some hands, I see some nods. Great, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I just I want to make sure that I'm not sort of that you know the the motivation for water watersheds becomes um, a little bit more apparent this week. So um, these are the objectives for the the this learning module that were this uh, the learning objectives for this module this week. So um, these are taken directly from sort of the longer list of learning objectives um, and um, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not going to read them. I'll I'll give you all sort of a second to to look at those here. Okay, so um, so let's start before we get into some of the material with a little bit of of context here, um, and um, and really we want to get after sort of, um, you know, why it's important to measure, like, why are we spending so much time measuring snowpack? Um, and, right, and, and why, you know, for instance, why is this important? Um, you know, something you may have asked yourselves last week, right, and, and maybe I said this in passing, but it's perhaps important to underscore, is that the, the NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the agency that's kind of responsible for maintaining the snow tail network and doing a lot of these snow surveys, right? Uh, it is embedded within the US Department of Agriculture, right? So you might ask yourselves like, why is an, an, an agency within the Department of Agriculture kind of so 
so heavily focused on snow? And the, the answer is, you know, sort of formulated in, in this kind of figure that I put together that, that underscores some interesting things about the, you know, the, the, the federal sort of water management apparatus, as well as kind of the processes themselves, right? And so this is the discharge hydrograph um, from the USGS uh, um, measurement station on the Boise River near Featherville. Idaho. This is for water year 2017, which started on October 1st, 2016 and ended uh, September 30th of 2017. So in blue, you see the actual, um, the actual hydrograph for the year. And in orange, you see kind of the, the median, you know, daily statistics over a 70, 75 year period, right? So this gives us a, a sense of, um, on average, right, or the, you know, this is the average uh, discharge in the Boise River. This is the this is water year 2017, and um, you know th this is kind of the thing that that a lot of end users, so farmers, um, municipalities, uh, you know, folks that are concerned with flood hazards, um, fisheries people, uh, recreational right boaters, um, the the Ada County parks, right, with the floating season on the Boise River. This is the kind of thing that they're interested in. And, you know, it's it's a function of the of the snowpack, the evolution of the snowpack in that year, right? So, you know, you see that there's a there's a pretty big correspondence between, you know, the the increase in snowpack and the sort of the snow melt or what we call the ablation period, right? Uh, the discharge hydrograph is on some level just sort of a a shifted and stretched version of this snowpack. And so, um, you know, what, what we really are after when we're measuring, you know, the, the snowpack and, and characterizing it at the watershed scale. So this is the, the snow water equivalent um, in the Boise River Basin is how we can translate this snow water equivalent, right? To what extent can we use this information to predict what this discharge will look like over the course of the season, right? And we're interested in that in a qualitative way, right? So, um, you know, a lot of those of you that, um, I don't know if any of you have, have sort of heard of, you know, there's, there's always these kinds of like um, rule of thumb kinds of things, right? Which is that, you know, I don't know, some of you have maybe heard, you know, if you're a gardener, uh, you know it's time to plant your tomatoes in Boise once the snow disappears from Schaefer Butte, right? So I don't know, how, how many of you have heard that? Any, any gardeners in there? Yeah, so right, um, that, that's a sort of qualitative indicator that's telling us something, right? That, that um, at, at the point in which the snow disappears from Schaefer Butte, we're sort of perhaps in a different sort of climatological season. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of old school, um, you know, folks even in the NRCS that sort of monitor, you know, when the snow water equivalent in the Boise drops below, you know, a, a certain threshold, what that means for the timing of the discharge, right? Um, and we're also interested in a very quantitative rate, way, right? My, my group does a lot of, you know, quantitative modeling to take information like this snowpack information and turn it into quantitative predictions of the timing of discharge, right? So, so this sets the motivation for you know why, particularly in the West, there's such a heavy, heavy focus on understanding you know what the snowpack is doing, what it's done historically, what it's doing in space, and how that might change in the future, right? Because we're really interested in getting at okay, what are the ramifications for the discharge in the Boise River and other rivers, you know, throughout the West. Um, and, you know, how might we need to sort of, you know, prepare both at an individual season as well as kind of over a longer period of time for potential changes in, in that stream flow. Okay, so, so this sets a little bit of the background and context of like why this, uh, why this lab is sort of Im important in the context of, of broader understanding of water in the West. And, you know, as we start to pivot into water in in rivers and streams the next unit of the class you know why the snowpack why understanding the snowpack what the snowpack is doing is important for you know that next unit
Okay. So um, this leads to kind of a more, you know, so what we're really interested in, in knowing, right, and, and what is a really hard problem for knowing is we're really interested in, in sort of how much snow. So this is a picture of, of the Reynolds Creek experimental watershed down in the Owyhee River um, or the Owyhee Mountains. Um, some of you, uh, some of you, there's actually a, a big, um, this is a research experimental watershed um, in, in Idaho that has been around since the 1960s. It's actually exceptionally famous um, for kind of the snow science um, and actually some of the rangeland ecology that this watershed has produced at a future date. Um, I would love to lead, if folks are actually interested in, in you know, post COVID, you know, maybe next fall or something, actually doing a, um, a, a short field course there, let me know, because I would actually love to, to lead one out there. Um, but, you know, this, this picture, I think, provides you a really nice, you know, when you look at this and you sort of ponder okay, well, how, how much snow is up there, right? If I had to sort of quantify, um, you know, the amount of snow in this picture in, you know, units of volume of water, right? So in, in total snow water equivalent or in the mass of water that is up there, how would I even go about doing that, right? What, what are the steps that I would take um, both in terms of, you know, measuring that snow you know, where would I measure that snow? How how frequently would I measure that snow in time? Where are places in the landscape that I might need to, you know, so-called oversample, right? Um, go back to again, or, or kind of, you know, put more um, infrastructure in, in measuring, right? How would I, how would I even do that, right? Um, so this, that sort of fundamental question and, the motivation of, of sort of, okay, well, this is important because that snow ultimately turns into or produces the runoff that, you know, this ranch and farm land in the foreground depend on, um, you know, it sort of really illustrates the point as to, to why, why this is important, but also kind of the, the nature, the complexity of the, of the problems. Um, and, you know, what I would submit to you, right, um, uh, Ian, right, is that, so this problem is actually an, an integral, right, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about why this is. It's not a formal mathematical integral, right? We're not interested in analytic solutions to integrals. We're interested in sort of numerical in, integrals, right? So we're interested in, in, you know, getting the snow at each individual point in that watershed, in those mountains, and then kind of summing up over this whole image, how much snow there is, right? And that's that's how this connects to um, the idea of an of an integral, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into to the introduction to the lab. Okay. Okay. So, but before we do that, like let's zoom even in closer. And and the next um, image I'm going to show you is an image from Dry Creek. Uh, this was actually from 2010. Um, this is uh, the, the so-called tree line catchment, which is sort of a small sub watershed within Dry Creek. You actually pass it, Bogus, the uh, Bogus Basin Road is basically in this part of the, the screen here, or uh, the slide here, right? So you pass it on the left as you're driving up to Bogus Basin. Um, and this, you know, this provides like a really, a really kind of nice illustration in, in finer detail of some of the complexities of um, why this is such a hard problem, right? Because this is, you know, to give you an idea of scale here, this is, you know, no more than about maybe like, you know, a hundred meters across here, right? Like this is a small watershed and yet there's a, a lot of spatial variability in, in the snow cover, right? In the amount of snow that's here on this date. And I believe that this was, either early April um, or late March in this particular year. Um, and so let's look at this figure and I want you all to sort of like, let's come up with a list of, of the different things that we see in this image that are causing snow to either be present or not present or present in, you know, sort of larger or smaller amounts. And so, what are the kinds of things that we're that we're seeing? 
and I'm just going to take notes here for everybody while we're, as you sort of pipe up or put something in the, the chat. Uh, shade spots, because you can tell the sun is probably not hitting where the snow is, but it's hitting where the not where where or where the not snow is hitting or where the yep. snow is. There we go. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so the idea here is that you know. Uh, on this side of the hillside here, right, this probably is getting more of that solar radiation than this side, right? That's that's called the aspect, right? Um, the direction that you're the direction that you're facing, right? So if you were, um, so the, the does everybody know how to measure aspect, right? It's it's sort of some somewhat similar to measuring um, the strike, right? So so you would stand on this hill slope with with your Brunton. Um, you would face the steepest direction of descent, right? So the, the so the fall line, if you were a skier, you'd point your compass in that direction and you'd get the compass bearing and that would be your aspect, right? Um, so the aspect, right? Um, and, and our activity in, in class today will be exploring and predicting sort of how we, where we would see, um, you know, where aspect might influence snow cover, okay? So what are the, what are some of the other things that we're seeing? Vegetation. vegetation yeah exactly vegetation perfect right um so and 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 this vegetation i'm gonna try and talk and and spell at the same time so uh vegetation affects uh snow cover in a couple of different really interesting ways so tying back to um to our our class last week right um the a really fascinating thing that happens here right is if you notice around this uh, this big fir tree here, right? There's this ring of, right? There's this ring of, of un, you know, s snow free area right here in the vicinity of this tree, right? And, and clearly it can't just be like snow from the tree melting and dripping down and melting the snow underneath it because it's wider than kind of the, the crown of the tree. And what's actually happening here is that, you know, this, this tree protrudes up above the snowpack. Its albedo, right, its color is darker than the snow. So it absorbs more of that solar radiation and it actually radiates long wave radiation down to the snowpack in the vicinity of it, right? So the presence of this tree actually causes um, some of that, so, some snow melt, right? Because it changes the energy balance in its vicinity. Um, so there's there's energy effects of um, energy effects of of vegetation, right? Um, what's another another sort of in addition to that sort of energy effect? Can anybody see uh, maybe in the foreground with these shrubs some of some other ways that veg vegetation is affecting the snow cover? I guess in the um, in the uh, you know that uh, <laughs> in the middle it doesn't have any snow. So like right here, Lacey, is that what you're talking about, or? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So w what's going on with these shrubs? You can you can sort of see it's maybe hard, right? You can sort of see it with this little sapling too. Is that? Um, you know what what winds up happening is that these shrubs produce the um, the the effects are on um, what we call snow redistribution, right? So when the wind is blowing snow, right, it can have a couple of different effects. One is that the vegetation can just block the snow, right? So if you had a, a much denser um, sagebrush coverage here, you might have more snow because it's working to trap, right? It's acting as sort of a natural snow fence. Um, in this case, though, right, the, the vegetation is, is um, sparse enough, it's far enough apart that these trees are sort of acting as, um, you know, acting almost as sort of like, you know, bridge piers. You can see this pole as well has the same effect where there's a scouring effect right around the vicinity, right? So, so the wind that sort of comes in the vicinity of this pole right, um, as, it, as it has to navigate around the pole, it has to accelerate, right? Um, and so you get faster wind speeds in the vicinity of this vegetation and it can actually serve to scour, 
um, the snow that's here, right? So, so you get like a little bit of a scouring effect um, or you get sort of a blocking effect, right? And so we would call these effects on redistribution of snow. Okay. All right, any other effects here that we can see? Steepness Thoughts people have? Slope. Steepness of the slope, yeah. So uh, steepness, steepness of slope, that's right. So, um, you know, on, on sort of the, the more shallow facing snow slopes, we potentially have like a little bit more potential for snow cover. Those slopes that tend to be steeper have a larger potential for that sort of like mass mass movement. Okay, any, any other thoughts? Um, I'll interject one um, if, if folks don't have any more thoughts. I'll interject one that's kind of a, um, a curveball in terms of snow science. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, some of you may have actually seen there was a large, uh, a large occurrence in Europe recently where this came into play. Um, any other effects that people have here? No. Okay. Um, another one is is actually the presence of dust, and this is this is a really hard one, right? So I don't know if if any of you saw um, recently in the Alps, right? There was this really big effect. We talked about dust in the context of cloud condensation nuclei, right? And and wind blowing off the Sahara and creating this dust that ultimately helped the formation of tropical cyclones in the eastern Atlantic, right? Um, Dust also plays a really big important role in um, snow energy balance. And there was a huge uh, event uh, just maybe last week or the week before last, where um, there was a large dust event from, um, from the Sahara that blew north up into the Alps um, and coated uh, a good chunk of the, the, um, the Alps with this layer of dust, right? And so dust you know, changes the color you know, that there are actually people out there skiing, sort of showing their ski tracks over this kind of dust on snow event, um, showing this really big contrast between the dust covered um, snowpack and where their skis had sort of removed the snow. Um, and it was, it was a really big contrast. And so the, the dust serves to change the, um, change the, basically the color of the top of the snowpack, right, which influences that energy balance, right? It causes the snow to absorb more solar radiation, um, which, you know, causes potentially melt, right? And so um, dust is a really kind of complicated thing. It's influenced by a variety of, of different things. It's, it's influenced, for instance, by windstorms hundreds of miles away. Um, it's also influenced by, for instance, the use or not use of, for instance, cover crops, right? And so in places like the Central Valley in California, um, you know, when, when farmers aren't using cover crops as much and there's large kind of wind events in the wintertime, it uh, injects a bunch of dust and dirt up into the atmosphere that ultimately makes its way into the Sierras, right? And so there's been some, uh, some literature to sort of talk about correlations between the use of cover crops um, and the the degree of dusting events. Okay, so it's a, it's a really fascinating problem. Um, okay, so you know these are the types of things that you know. So aspect, yes, absolutely, vegetation, um, and and you know the and the complexity of vegetation, right? The degree to which vegetation is influencing the energy balance locally versus the redistribution of snow by wind events, um, steepness, right, the, the presence or absence of dust. Um, and then if we were to zoom back out, right, in that last image on the last slide, clearly there's an elevation effect, right? So at, at coarser scales, there's less snow here, right, and more snow up here. So there's also kind of, of elevation effects. So I'll just write that down. It's not really present in this figure, but let me go ahead and capture it. Um, so these are all um, factors in the landscape that we we need to account for in, in how they affect the, the presence or absence and the amount of snow that's present. If we wanted to go out and, and 
measure the volume um, of snow in a watershed, right? And, and another way of saying that is that um, if we were to focus on any one of these features individually, right, if we just designed a snow sampling, um, a snow sampling uh, survey around aspect, for instance, or differences in aspect, we'd be missing out on all of these other factors, right? Um, similarly, um, if we were to design it purely based on elevation, right? And for now, we're gonna we're gonna do that in the lab. We're only, only gonna focus on elevation trends. But if we were to only focus on elevation, we'd be missing out on all of these other factors, right? So the 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 upshot is that as we um, as we think about how we would go about in the landscape designing a survey to, to measure and estimate the total storage of snow water in a watershed, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity that we need to cover, but we're, we're not doing this in an environment of kind of un, unlimited resources, right? We can't literally go out and measure the snow every kind of 100 meters in our um, in our watershed, right? That's just physically unrealistic to do. So we need to think about, right, how we would design a, um, a campaign to go out and measure enough points and sample enough of those, um, enough of a gradient of those factors that affect um, snow volume to be able to come back and, and do some kind of quantitative estimate of how much snow we have in the landscape, okay? So, um, so this is a, a, in this slide here, um, you know, we're gonna do another kind of uh, brainstorming session um, in which we, we think about like, what, what are some elements that would make for a good snow survey, right? Um, you know, and, and um, you know, how, how would we be confident that we're getting enough samples in the landscape that we're covering all of those factors or at least um, doing, doing our best job at, at um, sampling across those factors that influence snow cover, right? So, so what would give us confidence that we're doing a good job, but also what are some of the important constraints, right? How, what are those things that limit our ability to get even more data and, and, and uh, be able to produce an even better estimate of snow volume? So let's actually start off with uh, the bad news first, right? Let's, let's list some important constraints that limit our ability to, um, uh, to measure, measure snow out in the field. Accessibility? Yeah, accessibility is a huge one, right? And, and uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, Well, I mean, if it's an area that like you can't get to easily and you need a helicopter to get there and you don't have the funds, then it just, it's impossible to uh, complete that task. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so accessibility just in terms of the, the terrain, right? So the ter terrain is tough. Um, and and um, that that's related to a, maybe something another thing here that I would sort of say safety, right? Um, there's there's different things. Oh gosh, my spelling is awful today. Safety, right? So uh, avalanche, avalanche safety. Um, another thing with accessibility is just uh, ownership of the land. Right. Um, this is less of a problem in, you know, a state like Idaho or in general in the West where a lot of the land is publicly owned. And, you know, ex you know, there's maybe limitations on the kinds of um, vehicles we can use. Right. Like if it's a national park or a wildlife area, we can't necessarily use snowmobiles, but, um, you know, we could hike, right? But at least we could be on the landscape. Um, if it's private land, right? That's a totally different story. You have to get permission from the landowner. You have to know who the landowner is, right? Um, and it involves a lot of kind of, if you need to get into that land, right? If, it, if it's particularly important, you need to sort of build relationships with that landowner, um, probably give them access to the knowledge and insight that you gain while on their land. 
Um, and frequently people are, are happy to help out with those kinds of things, right? Um, but it, you know, it, it's a process, it takes time. Um, okay, uh, other, other things, other constraints that we have? You have to make sure that the equipment isn't gonna break down and then- Absolutely. It's gonna be light enough to be able to take in. I guess that would go with accessibility, but you wanna be able to just leave it up there and get the information and not have to go out there all the time. Yeah, and if, if it's something, right, like, um, you know, for instance, the kinds of samplers that we would use, like a, a federal sampler, right? Um, if you remember those images, it comes in sort of sections of tubes, right? And those need to be screwed together in the field. Um, you know, it's easy to get impatient and to just, you know, force it if you if it hangs up and cross thread it and get it locked and you know um so there's all kinds of stuff that can go wrong with with the equipment right um and you know things like scales right uh scales can break scales can get out of calibration so just our general equipment reliability and truthfully right the the more you're using that equipment so the more um samples that you take uh you know probably the um the more, the more likely it is that you run into sort of issues of, of wear and tear and breakdown, right? So you can go out with the intent to collect hundreds and hundreds of measurements, but um, you're, you're probably at some point going to be pushing your equipment to, um, to its usability envelope, right? Other things? Time, like you only have so much time to take so many measurements. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is, that's a couple of different things, right? So uh, that is uh, just like um, the, the human factor, right? Um, right. So in this, you know, the, the other kind of big one here, what, what is time really? Like what, you know, time is what? Yeah, money, right? So, so cost, these, go, these go together, right? Um, so you could, you could always sort of buy yourself time and you do that by kind of hiring more people, but that costs money, right? So at the end of the day, you're in this constraint of how, mon how much money do I have? How much time do I have? And how good of an estimate do I need, right? And, and those three things together, um, you can change, you know, if you change one, you have to change, you know, you can't change, um, yeah, you can change two of those um, but that ultimately influences the other, right? You can't change all of them um, simultaneously. A change to one of them will result in a change to at least one other. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Any other kind of constraints that folks can think of? Uh, weather. You don't want to go on like a bad day, I guess. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, just in, in that probably relates to, to some extent to safety, right? Um, you don't want to be out in the landscape. You don't want to be, you know, putting people out. You, you all at some point um, will likely be in a position where you're maybe overseeing some technicians that have to do this, right? And so you're on some level of responsibility. You're responsible for their sort of safety and well-being. And so, you know, you need to think about, you um, you know, how much more do I need that additional observation? Is it is it literally worth putting somebody's life potentially in danger to get it, right? Those are ki the kinds of decisions that you all may be sort of faced with um, at some point in your career, okay? So this is a good list of constraints, right? This is kind of the bad news, but what is it, given these constraints, right? What are the kinds of things that we're trying to accomplish under these constraints? So what, what, are, what are some things that would make for a good, snow survey would it be like soil saturation that one like obviously depth and mass would be most important but to know how much runoff there will be do you need the soil saturation um um you ultimately would want that right information um let's Let's focus for the moment though on sort of like where, right? Like the, more of the logistical things of our, logistical facets of our survey, right? Like what, what would be, you know, how would we know um, we, we had a, a good uh, 
a good enough sort of sample of a watershed snow conditions to be able to infer what the volume is. Accuracy? Yeah, so we want accurate measurements, right? Um, and that potentially involves, for instance, um, taking multiple measurements at a site, right? Um, so uh, what we call replicates, right? So uh, you, you don't just go to a site and take one measurement, right, um, and, and call it good. You might take three measurements in the same vicinity, right, so that you have um, some amount, right? That, and that's uh, that those snow courses, for instance, that uh, the NRCS does are, are kind of, you know, uh, a transect, about a hundred meter long transect of an area in which they do a sample every, you know, every five meters or so. And the purpose of that really is to, is to get at accuracy, right? Um, I want a good measurement of snow where I do take it, okay? What are some other things that we, we would want to do? Um, I guess you could have a buddy, like a partner, because if you get the calculation wrong and they don't, then you're kind of screwed if you're just by yourself. Yeah, so um, so we would want, um, how would we say that? Like uh, maybe some degree of, of redundancy, right? Um, uh, I know a good way of saying that actually, redundancy. Um, so the, the term that we often use for this, gosh, my pen is awful today. It's not just my spelling. Um, so it's not just redundancy. It's also what we would call um, quality assurance, quality control, QA, QC. Um, right. So, so that's exactly what you just described, Ian, right? Is somebody else kind of looking at those calculations, looking at those measurements and saying, yes, I, I agree. Or, oh, you, you know, you just, you just uh, transposed the eight and the six in that, right? You, you, um, you swapped the decimal places or you put the decimal place, one, right? Just somebody to kind of, um, you know, uh, to just make sure that what's getting recorded is actually what's measured. Okay, Ellen, you said delimiting the study area, right? So we want a, a, we want a good definition of the system, right? Like a good system definition. So that's absolutely true. Um, what is the area that we're sampling, right? We wanna make sure that we don't waste any of these precious resources by measuring some place that um, is, is not necessarily important to what we're what we're measuring, okay. Other ideas? What about just the quantity of measurements? Yeah, we want like more measurements is better, right? More measurements, okay. So that, Right, but that that and would that be in both time in space you talked about, but also over time? Yes, yep, in space and time. Right. So yeah, and and you know this this cuts directly against right. Um, these two are obviously sort of directly linked. Right, you can't get more measurements in either space or time without without more resources. Right, um, so um, more measurements, and then um, connecting it back to that last slide in which we, you know, kind of listed off some of those factors that afflu that influence um, snow accumulation and melt. What can we say about say about that? Um, I mean. We don't have to get too specific here, but would you want to just randomly sample the watershed or would you? You'd want to take measurements in a lot of different conditions, like on a steep slope, on a not steep slope, and stuff yeah. like that. Yep. So we, we might call that like a, you know, we want a, a representative, representative. Gosh, this pen is killing me. representative um, sample, 
or sampling. Okay. Okay. Um, and so th this is this is a, a good kind of um, right. So so anytime we design a field campaign, and that's this is whether it's you know snow or you could do this for kind of any other variable that you're measuring, whether it's you know discharge, soil moisture, groundwater, whatever. Um, you know, we we need to to think about the design of that that campaign in the context of the constraints that we're under and what we're trying to accomplish, right? And so the 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 purpose of this exercise is to just think about, right, um, that there's the the ideal campaign that you would like to do, and then there's kind of the you know there's the constraints that you that you have, right? Um, and um, and that this is a you know this is a, a complex um, you know this is a complex thing that you're trying to so-called optimize, right? You're trying to find the best field campaign that you can get given the limitations and the and the constraints that you're under, right? Um, and I'm not going to propose to you that there, right? There's no um, right. The the downside or the the bad news here is that there is uh, there's really no kind of like one size fits all answer to how to design a field campaign. It's always going to be based on what constraints you have, what it is you're trying to measure, um, and and the system itself, right? So um, a field campaign, for instance, in um, uh, in the Olympic River or in the Olympic Mountains um, uh, west of Seattle is going to be very different than a field campaign in Idaho, even given sort of the same dollar figure and same availability of resources, right? Just because those systems are very different, okay? So um, what this sort of brings us to is a little bit about um, thinking about, um, so, you know, we've done a lot in thinking about how the how the snowpack varies throughout the landscape. And this brings us to this idea or um, the, the notion that we, you know, we need to be thinking about the, the geospatial, right? The spatial characteristics of our landscape, of the landscape that we are sampling, okay? And um, how many of you, again, just through uh, a, a show of thumbs, um, like do the use your reaction emoji to indicate like with a thumbs up that who's had a GIS class yet? No, a few, okay. So maybe, so not that many actually. So, so this is good, all right. So, um, so what we're going to be doing in this lab this week is a very kind of gentle on-ramp to, to GIS, right? We're gonna be doing it in the spreadsheet, which, you know the the programmer in me is like mortified by that, but that's okay. Um, but but it's it's a good kind of way of seeing how we how we do things in a geospatial way, right? Because um, what we're going to be doing is thinking about um, how snow varies in the landscape, right? Looking at kind of different different attributes of um, different attributes of Dry Creek experimental watershed, so the watershed that you know, is just outside of our backyard and how we might design a field campaign to um, to measure snow volume in Dry Creek, but also kind of making a quantitative estimate based on some data that we already have, okay? So um, we have a, a group activity here um, and and you'll have access to these slides. So there's there's three um, there's three slides here. You already have access to them in the lab um, folder on Blackboard. Um, I've made another uh, Google slideshow in which everybody's going to kind of record some responses. But I'm going to go through these next three slides really quickly, and um, not really quickly, but I'm going to show you what they are, then give you. The, the the link where you can all sort of um, review them, and then um, and then I'm going to introduce an activity, right? Um, so 
so right here, this is the this is what we would refer to as a digital elevation model. The spatial resolution of this is um, uh, 180 meters. So this is Dry Creek. You can tell this is Dry Creek because I, I always like to say that this is sort of cat shaped, right? So like this is like an arm chair that the cat is sitting on top of. Here's the cat's ears and the cat's nose and the cat's tail. Um, so Dry Creek is the cat shaped watershed. Um, if we say if we say pixel or cell, um, what that means is just one of these little squares right here, right? So uh, one of these little squ squares right here is called a pixel. Um, that pixel has an, an elevation associated with it. Um, and the, the, when we say the resolution of the, of the, of this digital elevation model, what we mean is basically the width of of that pixel, right? So this width is 180 meters, right? And so uh, this is basically just a sampling of the elevation in Dry Creek Experimental Watershed, okay? Um, so uh, higher elevation up here, lower elevation down here, right? You can sort of see the dendritic patterns of the different drainages in Dry Creek. This is much coarser, right, in, in resolution than we would ordinarily use, but this is exactly the same uh, digital elevation model that you're going to be using in the, in the Google Sheet or Excel workbook, right? So I wanted to show you what the terrain looks like at the resolution you're going to be um, looking at it, okay? So this is the elevation. So some other things that were mentioned in terms of where we might want to uh, think about stratifying our sampling strategy, right? So oversampling and undersampling different areas. Um, so the next one that we'll think about is slope. So here is the slope of Dry Creek. This is at a slightly higher resolution. So this is at 90 meters. Um, so this is the uh, a square encompassing Dry Creek. Uh, the watershed itself is outlined here. Again, you can sort of see the cat in green, right? So high slope areas are uh, in, in redder colors. Lower slope areas are in blue. Um, you can sort of make sense of this in that, you know, this, the shallowest slopes tend to be at the valley bottoms here, right? So down in the riparian areas, the steepest slopes tend to be kind of um, those... Uh, hill slopes that are especially facing north, okay. Um, and so speaking of what direction they're facing, this is the associated aspect, right? So again, this is an area that encompasses Dry Creek. The cat here is in green, um, north facing, right? So I've colored these such that the, the colors kind of indicate the amount of solar radiation you're getting. So if it's blue, you're getting less. If it's yellow, you tend to be getting more in those parts of the in those parts of the landscape. Okay, so you have access to these um, both in the Blackboard site as well as in this next activity that we're going to do. And I am going to open this Google Doc, um, and I'm going to switch which screen I'm sharing. Okay, and so actually what I'm gonna do, so you all will have the ability, I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. You all will have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create six breakout rooms. So there'll be about um, three to four of you um, in a breakout room. Let me plunk this into the chat, okay. Um, what I would like you to do is hypothesize. Um, so, so there are six breakout rooms. There's one breakout room for um, two breakout rooms for elevation, two breakout rooms for slope, two breakout rooms for aspect. I'm gonna. I, I will create. Um, so this will be. Let's say I, taking renaming the rooms sort of takes a while. So this will be room one. Uh, this will be room two. Room three. 
room for room five and room six. Okay. And what you all will do as a group is I would like you to take maybe five minutes to discuss, right? So as an example here, um, I would like you to discuss how the snow water content might vary as a function of elevation. And, and this is, uh, sorry, in, in Dry Creek, okay? Um, and I'd like to su suggest to you that um, I, I want you to do a good job of sort of discussing how it might vary, right? Um, for instance, yeah, we would expect the snow, um, snow volume to increase with elevation in Dry Creek, but is it really kind of just a straight line or is it something more complex than that and, and why basically, right? Um, so, um, and then what I want you to do is you can uh, have one person kind of be the, the recorder, but I want you to hypothesize a relationship between snow volume, snow water volume and this variable elevation uh, slope or aspect and I want you to draw a single curve for your group that is basically a hypothesis or a prediction of what you think snow volume will look like in Dry Creek. Um, so is that clear for everybody? So we're gonna take about 15 minutes to do this. Um, just use the drawing tools up here. So you can use a scribble or a curve, um, whatever you need to. You know, Don't worry about being too precise on this. Um, but we're, we're gonna take about 15 minutes um, and then we're gonna come back and ask people to sort of explain, um, explain what they got um, or explain what their prediction is. And um, so, so have somebody be a recorder and then have somebody be a reporter when you come back out. Okay, so I'm gonna create the breakout rooms and assign people randomly. Um, let's see. Okay, and so I'm going to send you off now and I'll bring you back at about 1140, okay? Hey, Leho, could you send that link again? Oh, hold on. I can't hear you. One second. Sorry, I have to switch up everything. Oh no, that's my bad. I was I was uh <laughs> I was uh muted. So okay. Um have it now? Yes I do. Thank you. Um, a slope would be. We were wondering, so it's like. Oh, wait, hang on a minute. Something funky happened. Right? It's not oh. density. It's the trend on the slope of like where there will be more runoff. More, more water content. More snow water content. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So. Hey, Sam, did you have a question?
Okay, so folks are filtering back in. She almost just made me present. <laughs> Ma'am, I said one second. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and force people. I'm, uh, the nice part about this is I can see where everybody's at. So, um, okay, All right. So since most of you are out, I'm just going to close the rest of the rooms. And... Okay. Um, just waiting for a couple more. I always forget to choose that option that a minute is like a long time to wait for a breakout room to close, so. Okay, all right, welcome back everybody. Um, let's just go through quickly. Um, so uh, room one, does somebody want, oh, sorry, my mouse is very, uh, room one, does somebody wanna discuss what you, what you came up with? Did you nominate a speaker? Sorry, I was trying to get to where I could unmute myself. So okay. kind of what we discussed is um, how we know that uh, temperature at higher elevation decreases so that it would give more area for snow to build up. Um, but we weren't really sure if it would be linear or if it would have like a little bit of a curve to the end of it um, or what would impact that. Yeah, that's a great question, right? Um, uh, and if it's linear, right, is, you know, so one question I would put to you all is, is there a threshold, right? Is there some elevation above which um, you have snow and some elevation at which you wouldn't, right? Great. Uh, room two. So we obviously thought low slopes would have more snow and that's because we just thought that it would be more able to accumulate throughout time because it's not like falling down the slope yeah and then we didn't know if there would be any variation in the linear we didn't think there would have slope was the only um factor that we were looking at yeah yeah um you know you, you could think for instance um if if there were some kind of mechanical properties of snow right and, and maybe you get into this in um, HP's class, right, where where there's some, uh, right, uh, the, in 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 soils and rock, there's this notion of an angle of repose, right? So like a maximum angle that um, you know that that a pile of rocks or sand can um, can tolerate, and you know if there is an angle of repose to slope or to snow, right? Maybe there's like some critical slope at which you know you just can't sustain any snow whatsoever. So good. All right. Okay, so uh, room three. Yeah, so our main thought was that north facing would have the least amount of direct sunlight so that there'll be the most volume of snow on those slopes. South obviously would have the most direct sunlight so there would be the least amount of snow there. And then we were thinking for east versus west, that west would probably get more sunlight or at least warmer sunlight because it's not like in the morning. So that there would be a little bit less snow on west facing slopes than on the east facing slopes. Great, yeah, that's that's a really, so, you know, 
clearly some good thoughts there with respect to north and south facing. I like the sort of subtle thinking about whether east and west, right, does that make a difference? Because as you point out, right, like maybe they get about the same amount of solar radiation, but it occurs at sort of different times of the day when the temperatures are, are certainly different. So that's uh, some really nuanced thought there. That's, that's great. Okay, room four. When we said that uh, lower elevations typically have less snow, and we thought that at least in the DCEW or Dark Creek Water Experimental Watershed, whatever it's called, um, we thought that it was strictly linear um, because it only because the this watershed only goes up to two thousand meters. So we thought there might be that threshold where it does peter out um, once you get higher. But as far as this watershed goes, it's not um, super super high enough to have that. Uh, that yeah, that's great. So the the idea is that um, you know maybe the behavior of this this curve is is different if you're looking at a much different scale, right? The Dry Creek is maybe, you're only looking at part of a larger, part of something larger, right? So that's um, that's some really, you know, that's some good thought as well. Uh, room five. So we had the same idea as the earlier group on slope where accumulation would occur at lower slopes. But then we said that the graph could get a lot more complex if you start factoring on other things. So it could change. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So um, a, a, a good point here, right, is that um, I kind of, I didn't really over prescribe, you know, for instance, slopes at which elevation, right, or slopes on, you know, which aspect, right? So if you introduced another variable into this, you might have had a different, um, a different interpretation, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe if these were uh, places of low slope versus high slope at lower elevations in the watershed, it might be very different than low slopes and high slopes at, at higher elevations. So that's a really good point. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, room six. Um, so looking at the aspect map that you provided and just like our own knowledge of sunlight in this part uh, of Idaho this time of year, um, we decided that the north facing slopes would probably be getting the least amount of like sunlight, so they would be lower on the aspect, and then um, east would be getting slightly less than like west facing slopes, um, and then the south facing slopes would be getting the most over the course of the day. And is this, uh, wh uh, what are you all plotting on the y axis here? Matt? We were plotting like aspect overall. Okay. Like, the amount of sunlight, yeah. Okay, amount of sunlight, okay. Great, um, so great. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, add that here. So yeah, so the idea that um, north facing slopes, right, would be tending to get less sunlight at this time of, um, particularly at this time of year, right, when the sun angles are lower in the sky, so great, okay. Um, well, that's a great, so I really like the, the nuanced discussion that happened there, right? Um, you all came up with um, some really, uh, I think, reasonable predictions, um, but also sort of had some kind of very nuanced uh, discussion there to say, well, this is what we think, but on the other hand, here might be some, here might be some things that we need to think about. Um, and you know, so this is great thought. I, I want you to think about that. So as we kind of go away and come back for lab, um, we'll introduce um, what we're going to be doing in the lab. And then at the end of the lab in the discussion, you'll, you'll be prompted to sort of think about, right, um, okay, what are the limitations of the data that you've already been given? If you were to go back and design a sampling scheme, how might you think about this in a more complex way? And so, um, so uh, I'll keep the link to this, but you might want to as well, uh, maybe paste the link to this, um, to this slide deck in your copied uh, lab packet, um, just so that you have it there for reference, okay? All right, so I will, we will call it there and I will see you all um, in about 15 minutes. So go ahead, take a bio break, grab something to eat, and I'll see you in a few.